I'd like to introduce Ken Burns, who will introduce our speaker and session for today. Good morning. I'm uh, pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Desmond Schatz, who is currently serving as the interim chair of the Department of Pediatrics and who may be in this position longer than many who theoretically were the permanent chairs. But in any event, uh, Dr. Schatz, I think has been very successful in this role. Uh, he came to us uh, from South Africa uh, where he went to medical school at what I think is called Witwatersrand. There may be another pronunciation. But after medical school, he came to the University of Florida where he did a residence say, in uh, pediatrics. And he enjoyed it so much that he has just stayed here. Uh, over the years, he has become a preeminent pediatric endocrinologist uh, with a uh, research interest in uh, type one diabetes. Uh, he's uh, been uh, well-funded for this research, uh, both from private foundations and from the, uh, from the NIH. And he uh, <clears throat> actually right now is participating in an international uh, uh, project. Uh, so I think that uh, his renown in this area is quite significant um, to the extent that he had served as the uh, president for science of the leading uh, patient efficacy organization, the American Diabetes Association, and that's an extremely uh, high honor. And, uh, so uh, he's a really great representative of the university. Of Florida. Uh, I don't know if he ever became a U.S. citizen, but I have to assume that he did eventually. Uh, in any event, he's here with us today. Before I do more damage to his reputation, uh, let me introduce Dr. Shams. Dales? Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ken. It's really a pleasure, frankly, to, to be here. And um, well, very good. Well, uh, thank you very much again, Ken. Yes, I'm a U.S. citizen, um, and uh, Izzy Shiva may have some uh, concerns with that, but be that as it may, I would thought that I would present um, a talk today um, as a debate, as really a debate with myself and really um, a debate with you. And um, this could be conversational. Um, um, it's feel free to interrupt me at any times. Um, I think we have um, about an hour or so. Um, I wish I was present uh, with you all. Um, I certainly recognize, you know, so many of you, um, Izzy, Roy, David, Ken, Jeff, uh, Cindy, so many people I do know. So. Again, um, the title of my talk is, should we be screening for type one diabetes and is it time to reevaluate our recommendations? And this is 2021. I just thought I would simply remind all of you that not all of diabetes is the same and that there is a very big difference between type one and type two diabetes. People put these together in a bucket and that is absolutely wrong. They're very different diseases. And I'm going to say to you, what I'm going to focus on today is type 1 diabetes, not type 2 diabetes, which is so much more prevalent. 90% of all diabetes is type 2 diabetes, but about 10% is type 1. And um, the usual clinical course of insulin-dependent diabetes is, is always insulin. There's an absolute lack of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, um, through a combination of insulin resistance and um, you know, insulin failure, uh, there's non-insulin uh, dependent diabetes, but over time people do become insulin dependent. The usual age of onset for type one, we always believed was called juvenile diabetes. So it was young diabetes, but now 
uh, we're finding that more and more type two diabetes are really type one. So about 50% of them are, are people who get diabetes are now over the age of 20 years. Um, usually in type two diabetes, again, usually over the age of 40, but with the obesity epidemic, we're seeing it in young people as young as 10 years of age. Body weight is classically lean, although as I said, with the rising um, uh, waistlines of all of us, uh, we're seeing even type ones presenting with uh, diabetes who are a little overweight, but type two diabetes are always obese. The onset of type one is usually acute and type two, um, it's usually subtle, slow until they too may present in what's called diabetic ketoacidosis and particularly in minorities in blacks and Hispanics. Now, it's very important to understand the family history and this is will also go to the crux of my discussion is that um, in type two diabetes, very common to have a family member uh, with type two diabetes, but much less so in patients with type one, where less than 15% um, have a first degree relative uh, with type one diabetes. Type one diabetes is, is, occurs predominantly in, in, um, in, in, in Caucasians and whites. Uh, so, and uh, type two diabetes is more common in minorities, blacks and Hispanics. And that's where the incidence and therefore the prevalence is increasing significantly. Uh, type 1 diabetes is closely uh, associated with the HLA, which is uh, the human leukocyte antigen, which is found on chromosome 6. And it's particularly associated with the uh, HLA class 2 uh, genes, HLA BR3, 4, which are in linkage disequilibrium, which deep with DQ beta 201 or 302. And that is very unique to type 1 diabetes. And uh, because type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, you find the presence of islet autoantibodies, which I've listed. These are islet cell antibodies, antibodies to glutamic acid decarboxylase, IA2 antibodies, antibodies to insulin, and antibodies to the zinc transporter 8. So we always found that, 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 that they were never present in type 2, but now we find that 5 to 10% of type 2s actually have it. And it brings up the debate all along is that are these type twos really slow up, slowly progressive type ones or are these antibodies not, the, not directly related to the cause of the disease, but really more some damage to the insulin producing cells? So again, my focus today is going to be on type one diabetes. Now, about four plus years ago, I gave my presidential address to several thousand people at the American Diabetes Association in which I said that we've had considerable successes, but we've also had failures, which is the nature of science. And I will sort of go through them in a bit to really introduce um, my talk for today, which is our successes are that we do know through the diabetes control and complications trial that if you have diabetes, that tight control does reduce complications. And that, that signaled when, when I first started, and some of you may know Arlen Rosenblum, who was really the founder of the department. And in the early 90s, he didn't believe that, that tight control made a difference. It was just a matter of insulin. Well, in 1993, that changed everything. And tight control and uh, an era of intensive management, technological advances, and what we call hybrid closed loop artificial pancreas systems really make a difference and can, and can certainly uh, reduce complications and improve the quality of life. But again, remember, and this was the title of a conference that I put on several years ago, that insulin is not a cure. What else have we learned? That better understanding of the beta cells, those are the, the, the cells that make insulin, um, the biology leading to replacement of the beta cell function, and this sets a stage for a cure. But again, there is no cure just yet. And again, and finally, and a lot of the work has been done here at the University of Florida, initially started by Noel McLaren, and then continued by myself and Mark Atkinson and, and others, that type 1 diabetes is now a readily predictable immune-mediated disease, which sets the stage for prevention. But there is no prevention. But in order to get people that we can prevent, we may need to be screening screening for this disease. So 
I want to say what the current American Diabetes Association recommendations are, and this was something that I had written before, is that screening for type 1 diabetes in asymptomatic children with a panel of autoantibodies is currently recommended, but only in the context of research. And in, in the context of research in relatives of patients with type 1 diabetes and that widespread testing of asymptomatic low-risk individuals is not currently rec recommended as part of public health screening due to a lack of a therapeutic intervention. If I said to you now that we could prevent the disease, there'd be no question in my mind we should be screening. But what, what brings me uh, to the current ADA recommendations? So let's perhaps take a step and ask the question, why are we currently screening for type 1 diabetes in 2021? Well, the, the protagonists of this argument would say that it's an early diagnosis. And it's, it's true that if you make an early diagnosis, we can decrease morbidity and mortality. That's short term. We can hypoglycemia, seizures, diabetic ketoacidosis, and mortality. Uh, the lifespan of a person with type 1 is the same as somebody who doesn't have uh, type 1 diabetes. That's an incredible data uh, announcement from um, the group up in Pittsburgh. Really fabulous uh, data as long as you take care of this. But also, um, we've learned a lot about the natural history of pre-type 1 diabetes, so as to gain a, an, an understanding of it. To gain further insight into the etiology and what causes the disease, although we don't have a cause just now, and whoever does find the cause or the mechanisms leading to type 1 diabetes will surely win a Nobel Prize, but also to identify individuals for prevention trials, because again, without prevention, there will never be a cure. Now, let's get to the, to, 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 to the crux of the matter too, is are we ready for public health screening? Now, what is, what is the goal of public health screening? It's the early identification of a burdensome disease with the long-term goal of reducing the incidence and mortality and improving health outcomes for that disease in the asymptomatic population being screened. But again, there are certain criteria that need to be met for public health screening programs. Now, these are well said, these have been adopted in a, you know, this is what the science tells us. I mean, there are clearly people right now who wanna ignore the science in so many areas. But from my perspective, these are the criteria. We have not yet met all the criteria for a public health screening program. So firstly, the disease. Inherent in that definition is an important health problem. Is type 1 diabetes an important health problem? Absolutely. It's about one in, one in 250 to 300 in the United States and um, much, much higher in Finland, as I'm going to show you some of those data uh, uh, soon. It's a recognizable early stage of the condition. Absolutely. We can uh, detect the disease many years before the onset of the disease. Do we have valid, reliable, and afforded affordable tests now for identifying those that we're going to deem eligible for an intervention. So part of every fellow's training is to learn about sensitivity, specificity, uh, positive predictive value, indeed negative predictive value, as well as false positives, which I'm going to sort of argue with you later on during this talk. And then the diagnosis and the treatment. Understand that any treatment, we follow the principle primum non nocere. We, we certainly know we certainly can't hurt any patient you know, at the expense of a therapy. So the benefits outweigh the potential for harm. What about costs? Some of the things, unfortunately, are very much disregarded right now, and that's the costs. You can say, well, you know, if you spend anything you can to save a life, but the answer is that's unaffordable. It's unaffordable to, to just randomly spend money when we don't have therapy. 
that is deemed to be efficacious. So costs have to be economically balanced with potential savings for the disease. That's the morbidity and the mortality of the disease. And that a credible early intervention must be available to improve healthcare outcomes. And this is the big, biggest issue right now. We don't have a, a fully approved intervention that can certainly delay the onset and prevent the disease. So let me go through some of those um, to show you um, how important type 1 diabetes is. The incidence is doubling every 20 years. And in very young, those are really under the age of 10, the incidence is doubling every 10 years. And you can sort of see, I'm going to just sort of show you the Finnish data that's shown here in red or in orange on your screen, where in the early 1950s, it was about 10 to 12 per 100,000 per year. So shown on the y-axis is are the number of cases per 100,000 per year, and this is time. And right now in Finland, it's about 80 per 100,000 per year. One in 125, easy to remember kids, under the age of 16 actually have type one diabetes. And it's a huge burden. So again, there is diabetes rising. I'm gonna go from left to right. The prevalence is one in 300, probably one in 250, They're approximately one, one and a half um, million people that actually have type one diabetes. If you look at other um, um, really, um, other data is some people say two to three million, but from what I would say, it's probably about one and a half million. The annual incidence, that's the number of new cases per year, about 20,000 per year, with the most rapid increase in children under the age of five, and that the prevalence is expected to, meet, to, meet, to reach five million by the year 2050. Well, without proper care, is a shortened life expectancy. People who live with type one diabetes know about the short-term complications, which is hypoglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. And you've always got to be aware and anybody with type one diabetes has to be screened um, on a regular basis for the long-term complications, which is myocardial infarction, um, stroke, kidney disease, neuropathy, and retinopathy. But it's not cheap. And the annual healthcare costs, and this, this slide is about two years old, so um, I would imagine that the annual healthcare costs have rocketed to about 25,000 per year. Again, this is all, but the hospital charge for an admission to the ICU two years ago was 26,000. It's closer to $40,000 per day. And the annual medical cost and loss of income totals about $14.4 billion. So clearly we need to make strides towards preventing the disease. You get it. So what is the consequences of a delayed diagnosis? And I'm just gonna give you three examples here of some tragic and really unavoid, tragic and avoidable deaths that results from missed diagnosis. Um, days after celebrating his first birthday, these are the headlines in one of the Tennessee newspapers. Um, and by the way, these are all quotes from newspapers. A boy dies after being misdiagnosed with a virus. This was an 11 year old uh, child whose mother said, you know, I was planning a vacation. Um, mom said she was planning a vacation for the family. Instead, she ended up planning a funeral. Um, and, and another 11 year, year old di was diagnosed with type one diabetes too late. Um, ignored the symptoms, classical symptoms of diabetes and died suddenly over the weeks. And a 25 year old doctoral candidate passed away suddenly from complications due to undiagnosed type one diabetes. And th these are not anomalies. We see two year olds, um, we'd actually, through a research study we had done, we had saved a child's life. This is a true story. We had screened uh, as part of our, what's called PANDA studies. We had screened um, a baby, this is several years ago, with, with, for, for genes, for risk for diabetes. We told the mother that their child was at risk, had the high risk genes. The mother said, there's no one in our family. You know, we're gonna ignore it completely. Um, you know, um, thank you for letting us know. We're glad we participated. At about the age of two, she suddenly realized that her baby 
was wearing diapers incredibly. The, the diapers were saturated. They were always wet. If she had another child before she realized something was abnormal, she went into a local GP uh, in Ocala. It was a Friday afternoon. The, the pediatrician, uh, GP pediatrician said, don't worry, it's natural. All babies wet their diapers. She said, I'm not leaving here until you you know, check for diabetes. She said, oh, it's never, they're not going to be diabetes. It's rearing two-year-olds. They put a they put a stick in the urine, it lit up, they sent it to us. I saw the kid myself a couple of hours later, cut a long story short, uh, the baby was put in the ICU, the blood sugar was 1450 and was in ketoacidosis. Had she not gone in and insisted that they do this test, this child too would, would not have been it. So clearly in that particular child was lucky to be part of a research study. Diabetic ketoacidosis is increasing. And you would have thought that by now with, with better testing uh, uh, um, modalities, we would have seen a decrease, but this is not happening. In 2002, the SEARCH, which is an NIH uh, epidemiological study found that about 20 to 25% of patients actually had DKA, that's diabetic ketoacidosis, which does have a one to 2% mortality, uh, but now it's about 50%. Um, and it's, 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 it's despite, uh, you know, people being more aware of the disease, the, the, the incidence of diabetic ketoacidosis is in fact going up. So I, I've explained to you about um, the diagnosis and the necessity uh, for, for instituting a screening test to make it much earlier. So the, then the next question is, well, what have we learned? What have we learned about the natural history of type one diabetes? And this really, this slide, perhaps sums up really um, my lifetime body of work in trying to understand the natural history of the disease, really beginning in the early 80s with Noel McLaren, and then you know, really understanding uh, about the natural history disease. Now, on the y-axis is the beta cell function, and on the x-axis is pi. And we do know, that, as I've said to you before in my introduction, that there is a genetic predisposition. And the genetic predisposition is is, is largely uh, controlled by the HLA region on chromosome six. That's the HLA uh, class two alleles, DR3 and DR4. So there's a genetic predisposition. I put the word here, a putative environmental trigger, but I will say to you, we have not yet found what that environmental trigger is. We embarked on a, a 15 year, what's called Teddy, the environmental determinants of diabetes in youth type one study. Uh, which was being conducted here at the University of Florida, together with two or three other sites in the United States, in Colorado, as well as Washington State, plus three other countries, uh, Germany, um, Sweden, and Finland, to identify this trigger, which we have not yet found. And then what, what we do know that afterwards, there was time that through beta cell injury for research we've done in the National Pancreatic Organ Donor Program, that you can detect um, um, injury to those cells that make insulin. Those are um, insulin producing cells. Those, those little things in the black are T cells. Those are CD3 positive T cells. So there is an inflammatory process that's occurring within those beta cells. With time, as those beta cells are killed, you get a loss of first phase insulin secretion that proceeds to glucose intolerance, which we can pick, the, pick up on moral glucose tolerance test. And then we have clinical diabetes. So we've learned a lot about you know, this disease. We do know that if you have these high-risk HLA genes uh, and you, you can look for them at birth and you've got the very, very high-risk genes, that's HLA DR34, that confers a 50% risk and that um, but there are another 40 non-HLA genes. So you, know, you ask, are genes necessary? Um, probably, are they sufficient? No, are they neither necessary nor sufficient? That's an argument. That's another part of the debate. But what we do know is that you can certainly detect antibodies. That's, if you will, the smoke of the fire in the peripheral blood. And there are several of these antibodies, as I said, islet cell antibodies, insulin autoantibodies, antibodies to glutamic acid decarboxylase, um, antibodies to the um, antigen ICA512 and um, antibodies to ZNT8 
uh, antigens. So we can detect those in the blood. And again, whether they're the smoke of the fire, whether they're epiphenomena, whether they're involved in the actual process leading to type 1 diabetes, we don't know because we still don't know what causes type 1 diabetes. And the subject of another talk that I may give would be, is this a suicide or indeed a homicide of the beta cell, those cells that make insulin. But what this slide has done is to enable us to set the stage for the early detection of type 1 diabetes. And it's a busy slide, so I am going to walk you through it. Now, you'd have to really understand the previous slide to understand it. There is a genetic risk. And we do know that if you have a relative with type 1 diabetes, you have a 15 times greater risk of developing type 1 diabetes. Well, if you followed them, and you said, OK, we were going to prevent the disease in those patients. Well, you could probably do it by two ways. One is you could vaccinate. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a vaccine against type 1 diabetes? You take a vaccine and you know you're going to be prevented. Well, that's a possibility. Or else if we knew what the incriminating agent was, people have said it's breastfeeding, it's a lack of breastfeeding, it's too early introduction of cow's milk, it's not too early introduction of cow's milk, it's a different virus. It, we've been searching, I can give you a whole huge list, but we're not gonna find it. But wouldn't we be able to institute a primary prevention? I think everybody gets it, that's the ideal. But really, we don't know the incriminating agent and we can't, we don't have a vaccine. So then we get into the fact is, could we, stop the immune attack when the disease process is already underway. And so we can stage the disease and we can stage the disease from the knowledge of the natural history of the disease into three stages. And these are stage one, stage two, and stage three. And that gets into what we call secondary prevention, which is preventing the disease from going from um, what I would say is pre-diabetes to diabetes, and then a tertiary prevention would be you already have the, the onset of clinical symptoms and then preventing further progression uh, of the disease. So what is stage one? It's really normal blood sugar with two antibodies, two of those five that I've mentioned. Stage two, it's further down the uh, slide, if you will, and you get an abnormal blood sugar with two antibodies. Then you have clinical diagnosis, and then you get on to uh, long-standing disease. But those give opportunities. And I always say that uh, part of the, the, the fun for me is one of the opportunities, because I always do think that leadership, you know, demands that we find solutions, uh, you know, for these opportunities. So again, what is the risk of developing these, um, these um, um, uh, conditions? If we are to screen relatives, and here I've shown you five um, um, the antibodies, and they range between one and 5%. But if we look at the general population, also, there is also, depending on the assay, and for those who've done um, antibody assays, you know that there are false positives. So then if you were to sort of screen in populations, what is the risk of a false positive? But it's really, again, greater risk is in relatives. Now, what do we know? We've learned a lot. And here are some of our own data. And this looks at the progression to type 1 diabetes. And again, is the cumulative incidence on the y-axis and then the years from antibody determination here on the x-axis. Now, if you only have one antibody and you screen for one antibody, the risk of developing diabetes over 10 years is 10%. If, on the other hand, you, you, the, the risk of developing, anti, or developing disease, if you have many antibodies, goes up to about 80 to 90% in 10 years. So the more antibodies you have, the greater the number, uh, the greater the number and the greater the risk of developing diabetes. Well, what about by age? This is another thing, though. Now, even if you take multiple antibodies, now let's look at again, I want to show you under the age of six, it's about 90%. If for you, on the other hand, you're over the age of 35 and you have multiple antibodies, then the risk of progression, no longer 90%, it's about 20 to 30%, which again says to me, 
is this a different disease? Is this a different manifestation? You know, is this a different endotype? And you'll probably be hearing the word endotype more uh, in other conversations as, as we learn towards precision medicine, as we move towards finding a specific therapy that's going to intervene in a specific case. And this was actually another talk that I had given most recently at the retirement of Dorothy Becker, one of the world leaders in type 1 diabetes research from the University of Pittsburgh. We can also go and refine, uh, perhaps I'll skip over this very briefly, but we can define the risk very good by looking at not only number of antibodies and age, but by also looking at the amount of insulin as evidenced by C-peptide, glucose, and body mass index. So if you have a very low, what's called a DPT risk score, it's very low, but we can really refine it to about 90 to 95%, taking in all these other factors. So again, what has been, you know, where have we been going with, with risk? And as I've said to you, our focus has been on relatives because relatives, if, if the risk in the general population is one in 300, in, in relatives it's 15 fold uh, increased, that's one in 20. So one in 20, if you think of bang for your buck, you could sort of think about doing research in relatives first and second degree relatives. The problem with that is you're not gonna pick up too many people. And if you don't pick up too many people, you're not gonna have enough power. And the word power is used in the sense of, of, a, of, a, of a statistic uh, because this will only be 10 to 15% of all cases. In the general population, it's one in 300, which is 85 to 90% of all cases, which says really, if you wanna make a dent in this, you've gotta be screening the general population. Well, let's look at the absolute risk of genetic susceptibility and going back to what I've just told you. In the general population, remember it's one in 300. If you're a twin and you're a monozygotic twin, the risk is 30 to 50%. And if you follow them long enough, it exceeds 50%. This is 10 years. Dizygotic twin, five to 10%. The sibling of a, of a person with type one diabetes, 5%. The offspring of an affected father is increased compared to that of an affected mother. And there's a whole lot of discussion we could have about why the risk, which is one in 12, an affected father is, is higher than that of an affected mother. And then in parents, it's one in it's about one in 33 percent. So if you sort of think about 0.3 percent versus screening in relatives, which is so much higher, 15 fold, it is very clear to me from a cost effective basis why our research has focused on relatives. Again, just what is the absolute risk? I can say to you that if we do HLA typing, uh, according to, 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 to HLA-DR risk, all I wanna show you is that if you look at the very high risk, the HLA-DR3-4 in linkage disequilibrium with DQ beta 201 or 302, that risk in a first degree relative goes up to one in four. Right, a, a monozygotic twin, one in two, but if you have these HLA risk alleles, it's one in four. So you could perhaps put these people into a study as well as the general population, if you were to screen is one in 15, versus if you did the whole population, you didn't do HLA screening, that risk would be one in 15,000. So you clearly need to stratify. You clearly, you know, a one shoe fits all doesn't go unless you're really getting into the genes and unless you're getting into the autoimmune markets. But we did show, and these were um, data that, that I published much earlier in my career, uh, in which we asked the question, is the risk of developing diabetes in relatives and school children once you have antibodies the same? And the answer to that is yes. So what are the screening approaches? So in 2019, and this hasn't changed as of now, we said a stepwise approach should be a test should be simple, it should be inexpensive, and it should be sensitive. And as I've said to you, it needs to have high sensitivity and specificity to reduce the false positives and have a high positive predictive value. And there are two ways to do this, with primary genetic screening, which I've gone, or primary autoantibody screening. So the genetic screening, 
um, you, you do primary in a population and then you test antibodies in those at risk. But there are some challenges with it. With primary autoantibody screening, you, you test a very at-risk population and you look particularly for these uh, immune markers. So what is the advantages of population genetic screening? It's one test initially, it could be done at birth. You could use dried blood spots or cord blood. And then you follow up the antibodies uh, for, for those um, who are at risk, and that would be for 5%, and it would detect 60 to 80% of those at risk. Screening would be cheaper, approximately one third the cost. We could study etiology, the mechanism, the prospects of primary prevention. But the biggest problem with all that is that there are huge problems related to the number of people who you're going to falsely identify as positive. Well, there are a number of programs now going on around the world, uh, both within the United States, um, as well as in Germany and Scandinavia, that are actually doing type 1 screening. And some are doing HLA, and some are doing autoantibodies. And these are you know, all at risk. Um, uh, these are all studies that are occurring, you know, around the world. So how effective have they been? Well, in terms of preventing diabetes, we haven't shown that that's the case as yet. But what Teddy has shown is that if you indeed screen uh, for, for type 1 diabetes, clearly we've shown that um, there is reduced diabetic ketoacidosis in young children. And I want to show you at least four registries. And I so showed to you earlier on that the DKA occurs between 39 to 54% of new onset cases um, around the world. But with Teddy and with uh, screening for these high risk HLA genes at birth, this has been reduced to 16%. So clearly, Teddy reduces DKA risk. If you look at those under the age of five, um, really compared to all registries, uh, it's decreased, perhaps not as much as in Sweden as in Finland, but definitely reduces the risk of DKA in very young kids. Well, what about, um, what about um, its impact post-diagnosis? And these are data from Andrea Steck that were presented, and she's shown that there is better insulin secretion, hemoglobin A1C, and decreased insulin doses in the first year uh, post-diagnosis. And if that is the case, and if that's sustained, that's gonna lead to a decrease in complications down the road. But again, what we don't know, again, and this is it, is that will this earlier diagnosis and onset of insulin replacement lead to greater preserved beta cell mass over time and therefore decreased risk of hypoglycemia and long-term complications? And I would say to you, perhaps there is some evidence that this may be the case, but there are challenges towards population screening. And I'm going to try and present the other um, end of the debate or this argument with myself. What about the costs of screening? How good are we at predicting this disease? because the disease is clearly heterogeneous. I've already told you that the disease in a young child is very different from that in an older individual. And what are the negative consequences of screening? So what I wanna try and do is to, again, balance the positives that I've shown you. It makes all the sense in the world to do it versus some of the challenges of screening. So let's look at the 10-year uh, costs of screening. and. Um, this is per child, right? Think of hundreds of thousands that would be screened. This was the Turku cost analysis screening is that for genetic screening and ICA follow-up of an at-risk ch child, just that would be the target approach. It is about $245 per person. If we look at repeated ICA, repeated antibody screening of entire populations, let's say at the ages of three and then at the age of seven, because there is some um, switch that occurs over time, it's about $750. And that's for one person. And if we were to screen to reduce DKA, a break-even point would be a dollar per screening test and a break-even point 
should be 0.03 per antibody tested. So to get down for 733 to, to 0.03 is huge. And remember, it's not just the, the cost of the testing, it's hiring people to follow up, to pay for labor, to counsel, to understand, to speak to people, what is their risk, and then assuming that people you know, would be interested and willing to participate. You know, we are getting into an era of whole genome sequencing where we will be able to know about many diseases over time, whether we want to know about it or whether, the, whether we actually have the resources to do it is going to be a challenge, certainly over the next few years. Now, I want you to sort of understand, and this is really only for the PEPs biostatisticians, but it is something that I teach my fellows is, is to really understand Bayes' theorem. And you need to understand the, the equation for understanding positive predictive value, which, is the, which does take into account the sensitivity and the prevalence of a disease. And it's really important because a very small false positive rate. Now, can you imagine me telling you that your child is at risk for developing type one diabetes when in fact it's a false positive, right? The problem is, is that the positive predictive value declines with the low prevalence of the disease. And when a disease prevalence is low, so it's, when I say low, I mean, it's, it's still, you know, the incidence is one in 300, the specificity becomes more, diff more, more difficult. So, it's, so we do need to understand that it's different if it was happening all the time. Um, and so, something certainly now with a very high uh, prevalence, um, such as COVID, it really doesn't matter as much because you know the, the, there may be some false positives, but it's it's to me that's that's perfectly acceptable, you know, because of the high prevalence of the disease. So think about what this high positive rate does. It has an impact on families and and young parents particularly. I say older parents too, and grandparents um, are vulnerable. Right, you, you, you're sort of being told that your child's gonna get a disease and this may not be right. Or in fact, it may be right, but you don't even wanna know about the disease. And then what impact is that gonna have on the healthcare system? You know, this is gonna cost a lot of money. So does that mean that your insurance rates are gonna go up? Are we gonna take it out of, you know, Izzy Shiva's social security, uh, you know, uh, check? How are we gonna pay for this? You know, what is the possibility of uncovering variant conditions that we're, you know, have an unclear pathogenesis? We don't know that. So again, we do know that screening, and again, from data that I previously presented, does cause initial anxiety. There are lifestyle changes. Do people really understand risk when so much else is going on in their life? We're going to expose kids to repeated blood draws, inconvenient travel expenses, how accurate is this prediction? And really we don't have a prevention or cure. So by now I'm sort of saying to you, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea after all. And why do I also say this? I had shown you a slide in which I was pretty confident in which I'd shown you that we've learned a lot about the natural history of the disease. But again, let me say to you that not all type one diabetes is the same. And maybe some people will get autoantibodies and never get onto the disease. Maybe some people will get autoantibodies, show a de decrement, and then never get onto the disease, particularly if you're older people. But again, if you're screening for younger people, it's a lot more predictable. So it is a relapsing remitting disease, just like every other autoimmune disease, just like lupus, just like multiple sclerosis. It's a relapsing remitting autoimmune disease. Rheumatoid arthritis is another. And so if you were to screen, where would you fit in it? And if you're not gonna get the disease, where would the therapy you know, fit in? Negative consequences. And I, I will simply quote um, uh, from parents because I think we really need to be increasingly aware of the complexities of testing and to communicate the sensitivity to our patients. I think this is even more so now with you know, where we are, particularly with genetic testing, with uh, testing overall, 
I mean, even some of this applies to, to, to some of the testing and some of the um, crazy stuff that's, that's gone around COVID. But um, I'll, I'll quote um, from, a, from, a, from a father. It was scary when I found out my daughter was fine. I felt like we'd gone through a lot for nothing. False positive test. I was upset that the physicians were elusive, elusive about why my child had to repeat, return for a complete test. We were told that no news is good news. They never called back with the results. Pediatrician said a blood test was needed, but she herself didn't know what it was for. I mean, this would take a whole education. I live this, you know, every day, so I could counsel you on this, but not everybody can. So going back to the debate, and if no preventative therapy currently exists, then why screen? So I can I show you the case for is that there is significantly reduced diabetic ketoacidosis in these antibody positive individuals who've been identified through genetic screening. Prevention trials are promising. We can't prevent it. And, you know, there's one newer study that shows a delay of the disease. But again, we can't cure it yet. Uh, we are moving the field forward through better understanding of disease progression. And a general population screen would be a change in public health paradigm for type 1 diabetes. We're screening for, in the state of Florida, for almost 50 newborn screening diseases. And wouldn't it not be if we could get type 1 diabetes to be number 51 or number 52? But again, we need to change the cost benefit. And um, we're asking um, some of the studies. Um, and one of the studies, the ASK study in Colorado, is analyzing cost and cost effectiveness to study the appropriate ages to screen and psychosocial impact. There is a health economics proposal in Sweden. And we're also just looking at the effectiveness of screening and intervention with decreased incidence of diabetic ketoacidosis. I will say to you that the cost of actually doing the tests is going down because of technological innovation. We've got newer antibody assays and also whole genome sequencing. And again, you know, I would controversially say that my vision for the future would be whole genome sequencing at birth and then knowing what that is and then following a patient. If you do that, that's your patient for life. So again, you know, where are we? Um, the requirements for public health screening, yes. Um, it's of cost benefit to the individual and society. Clearly type one diabetes fits that paradigm. Can the disease be detected early enough to intervene? Yes. Do we have good methods for identifying those eligible for intervention? Sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, false positive rate, yes. The problem is, is that we don't have a credible intervention yet to prevent the disease. So, the conclusion which I wrote initially hasn't changed as screening should be performed in the context of defined research questions. And I would posit that wide scale public health screening should be begun as soon as cost benefit changes or an intervention is shown to be safe and efficacious in slowing progression. So even if we could prevent DK and it costs next to nothing to doing it, we should uh, be able to, to set up whole scale, you know, whole-scale public health screen. So with that, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues, the funding sources, you know, that, that, that I've had, that we've had over the years. But most of all, I'm indebted to you, the patients who have participated uh, so actively, you know, in this research. Because without really all, each and every person, each and every member of the team, we wouldn't have gotten to the point of having this debate. And the good thing about this debate is if you debate uh, for and against, you get to win a debate. So I will just, again, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm very happy during the next few minutes to answer any questions that you may have. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I wanna thank uh, Pushpa Kalra. I wanna thank Ken Burns. And most of all, I wanna thank all of you
who've given up an hour of your day uh, to spend time with me, albeit on Zoom, and I wish it was in person, and hopefully that can be done again in the not too distant future. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm here in our Oak Room at Oak Hammock, and I do see that we have some chat questions and comments, but let me ask first, any questions here? Pushpa, do you have one? Hi, Des, this is Pushpa. Uh, thank you for giving this wonderful lecture and bringing us all up to date. I just was wondering, what is the status of the pancreatic beta cell transplant? Is that still something that's possible, that works, that's possible, that helps, you know, transplant of beta cells? Yes, I think really there are, there are really two major well, areas with subsets. So there is whole pancreas transplantation, uh, of which there's uh, SPK, sequential pancreatic kidney transplant. There is pancreatic after kidney transplant, there's pancreatic kidney, and then there's just pancreas alone, and then there's beta cells. Um, again, um, what is, what is the, uh, what are you sac sacrificing if you do this? Um, whole pancreas transplant does work. There's a good, you know, five-year survival rate, but it, it's a lie. You're swapping uh, insulin for significant uh, transplant rejection drugs. And um, with the limitation in pancreas and the the benefit, which is not very clear, unless you're doing the kidney at the same time for people with advanced disease, people haven't done that. So then you bring up the good point about what about just isolating beta cells as was done in Edmonton, the Edmonton protocol, as well as done in my, Miami at the Diabetes Research Institute and people would get a, a large number of islets, those, cell, those are the cells that make insulin, put them back into the, into the into the body. The problem is, is that they lasted about a year. They still required insulin. They needed large numbers, and then another um, a bolus at the end of two years. And then, in essence, people have said they're not long lasting. The, there's little benefit at this point in time until we had, you know, an immeasurable amount of of beta cells. And that's a, that's 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 actually another talk which you could get. Is it's great to engineer beta cells, um, either, you know, in the test tube or through trans differentiation in vivo. So if you were to take embryonic stem cells or adult stem cells and trans differentiate them till you get an unlimited supply of beta cells until we're able to do that and get enough cells, I think that uh, beta cell replacement therapy is currently on hold. Um, just follow up. I would imagine that these transplants would also be attacked by the antibodies since. Yeah. So let me just say that the antibodies per se are non-pathogenic. Um, when I first started um, working in um, really my mentor's lab was a guy called Doug Barrett. Some of you may know Doug Barrett, but when I first started working in his labs, we thought that they were complement fixing and that they actually destroyed the pancreas. Well, they are complement fixing, but they're thought to be epiphenomena that, that really, and again, we don't even know whether, whether certainly the antibodies have, I believe, are non-pathogenic. They're the smoke of the fire. And so I, I'm not sure whether that this response, and that's why I say a suicide or homicide, I'm not sure whether the cells are actually being attacked by CD3 T cells, you know, a, because in the context of class one and class two HLA alleles, that you know you get an immune response. So I don't know um, if 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 those are T cells, and then what's happening is because of the damage, uh, the immune response is making, or the B cells are making antibody. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, we'll have to get you back here sometime later to talk on this subject. Uh, there are some chat questions here, Julianne. You want. Uh, there is a question here from Roy Weiner. Is there a national public health approach that is exemplary? So yes, Roy, Roy knows much more than I do being the authority in cancer. So I would say to you, Roy, I'd probably throw that back to you. You know, it's like public health screening for cancer. Is there an exemplary approach, you know, towards pre precision medicine? 
I, I don't think so. Um, that would just be my, uh, my answer. Um, you know, I, I, I follow some of the stuff that's happening in Europe. There are some countries ahead of the others, but I don't, I don't think that there's a single uh, national public health approach that is exemplary. I could probably, after I answer your next question, I'll throw it back to you because maybe you could answer that better than me. Why only 50% in monozygotic twins? And the answer is, is that it's, I said that genes are, 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 are maybe necessary and not sufficient. So, so clearly um, not 100% of, of monozygotic twins will, will get diabetes. I, I would probably again also ask you for certain cancers in which monozygotic twins, one would get it. I would imagine it's not 100% in the second, in the second twin. But in, certainly for type 1 diabetes, um, there's clearly something else that happens. And, it's, and that's why it's about 50% and not 100%. So I would love to hear your answers on both of those. Roy, do you want to respond? Please. It makes, it makes, makes me think that there is a multi-gene etiology. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it's as I said, no matter, and as, as I said, HLA contributes 50% uh, towards susceptibility. There are another 40 uh, other genes, but it's not all genes. So you can even get type 1 diabetes in people who do not have the very high risk genes. So, and we're seeing more and more of it, which suggests because of the epidemic of type 1 diabetes, that again, genes are, are not sufficient to develop. The disease, so uh, you know, there there just may be something else that overwhelms genes, or that in some cases genes are actually protective, which is the case for one of the alleles, DQ beta O six O two, which is a linkage with DR two. Dr. Um, Carl, let's let's go on. There's a hand up here. Is he? Is he? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Schatz. Um, I think it's your Social Security they'll take it out of, but. I, would you clarify? You showed the rise in 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 the disease. How much of that may be due to better detection, and how much may be due to change in diet over the years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that uh, if you were in the third world, I would say to you that I'd be more concerned about better detection. But we've had pretty good detection. You know, unfortunately, it's not a notifiable disease. You know, the, we, we had posited that we would like to make this a notifiable disease, but this is not the case. But I would say it, all the centers who, who really had reputable uh, physicians and reporting systems are reporting an increase. And so when you look at, for example, the studies that have been conducted by the CDC, the NIH, the search study, these have been looking at the same criteria over time, 2002, 2004, 2009, 2014. And you can clearly see this increase. The same goes for Scandinavia. So I'm not as, I'm not as concerned about greater detection. The other one about diet, you know, look, diet has clearly changed uh, really everything. You know, when I first started this in the 80s, about 10, 10% uh, of, of people with type 1 diabetes um, um, were overweight, obese. And now, I mean, in, in, in some of the studies, 70% of children are overweight and 35% are obese. So some people have suggested double diabetes. My personal feeling is that obesity may be an accelerant, but I don't believe obesity causes it. But could there be something else that's within the diet? I will tell you that within Teddy, we have looked at this very, very carefully, very, very closely, and we have not yet found a trigger, be it carbohydrate, be it protein, be it, uh, be it uh, fat, be it vitamins. I mean, there are lots that have been suggested early introduction, late introduction, gluten, no gluten, we have not been able to find 
any potential trigger. That's not to say that there isn't, but, but it's clearly, you know, certainly changed the phenotype, meaning that overweight and obesity certainly have accelerated, um, you know, um, in the United States and certainly are a major cause of type two diabetes, particularly in African-Americans, Hispanics, uh, the American Indian population uh, in the United States. Thank you, Ken, do you wanna continue on with questions? Do we have more time or what do you think? Yeah, that's fine. I actually have two comments for this. Uh, I thought the data, particularly for Finland, about the continual increase in the incidence uh, were striking, but it, it was paralleled by all the other places. And, and in Finland, they certainly have good public health data. So it's not more looking for it. There's something else going on. I don't think we understand it. The second comment is that I was uh, on a recent FDA panel, which looked at using uh, transplants for, for type one diabetes and, and uh, pancreatic transplants. And uh, uh, I have to tell you that the data were confused. Uh, it was approved for a restricted group to continue doing it but there was a lot of controversy over whether it conferred any benefit. So uh, I, I think the transplant issue is really an open question at this point. Uh, thank you. I also do want to acknowledge Ed Wilkinson who's on this call. Ed supported our research during a very critical time. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, when he took over its uh, department chair of pathology and laboratory medicine. Des, do you have qu uh, time for a couple of more questions? Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. There's screen. one on the chat that says uh, from Keith Berg, the question on statement that without prevention, there won't be a cure. Yeah. Please clarify why this might be so. Y yes, I have exactly two minutes because I've got to welcome the next, not welcome, but I've got to uh, sell a recruiting pitch to the next group of interns who, who are interviewing. So. Uh, just repeat your question. Uh, clarify your statement that without uh, yes. prevention, there won't yeah. be a cure. Yes, if it's an autoimmune disease and the immune system has memory. So just think of a vaccine. If you're vaccinated against something, you, you know, you're not going to get polio. You're not going to get diphtheria, tetanus because you're vaccinated against it. Well, the immune system has memory. If there, in fact, is a trigger, and even if you reverse the disease by, by replacing beta cells, it's going to come back again because the immune system is memory. That's the marker of the immune system. That a, a good immune system will recognize what caused it to begin with and will come back again. Okay, so I guess we are uh, at 11 o'clock. Sure. So if anybody has, still has questions, just send them on to Ken or to me and we'll pass them on to Des. Thank you so much. I'm sure, Ken, I see one from Cindy Dern and I'll answer that outside of this chat. Thank you. Yeah. Ken, Thank you, you have a closing Thank you very much. Bye-bye.